Welcome, I'm Glenn Anderson, producer and host of this TV series, Glenn's Parallax Perspectives. This series explores a wide variety of issues related to peace, social and economic justice, the environment, and nonviolent social change. We especially provide opportunities for the public to hear voices and viewpoints that are rarely heard in mainstream media. Mainstream media, politicians, and culture see the world in conventional ways. The establishment is stuck in how they see the world. In order to solve problems, we need to see things differently. This TV series, Glenn's Parallax Perspectives, can help us see things differently so we can solve problems at all levels from the local to the global. This series is called Glenn's Parallax Perspectives. Here's what the word parallax means. Put one finger in front of your nose and another finger farther away. Close one eye, then open that eye and close the other. Your fingers will seem to move. This is called a parallax view. This TV series invites you to look at issues from fresh perspectives. Also, see much information about the issues that we cover in this TV series and previous episodes of this series at my blog, www.parallaxperspectives.org. And now I invite you to watch this month's program. This month's interview on Glenn's Parallax Perspectives will inform you of a powerful and proven way to solve serious problems. Throughout all levels of government, and in the private sector, there are many cases of fraud, abuse, corruption, negligence, and dysfunctional systems. These hurt people, hurt the environment, waste money, interfere with honest services, and cause other kinds of problems. Fortunately, some people with firsthand experience decide to act on their consciences and report on the problems internally and if necessary, expose the problems publicly. These whistleblowers serve our society by telling the truth, sometimes at great risks to themselves. During this hour, we'll learn about whistleblowers from two expert guests. Louis Clark is the executive director of a nonprofit organization that helps whistleblowers. It's called the Government Accountability Project. And we'll talk about that organization during the interview. Dr. Scott Allen is a medical doctor with 40 years of experience working in refugee settings, jails, and so forth, along with his own regular medical practice. Dr. Allen was responsible for monitoring activities at the Department of Homeland Security's detention facilities. He and a colleague, Dr. Pamela McPherson, found serious problems and reported them, but the problems continued. So the doctors contacted Louis's organization, the Government Accountability Project, for help. Uh, and in this interview, uh, Scott Allen is speaking on his own behalf, not speaking for the Department of Homeland Security. Welcome. I'm glad that you're both here. Thank you. Pleasure to uh, be with you. Uh, let's start. Uh, Louis, if you could briefly describe the concept of what whistleblowing is and maybe some common scenarios when that occurs. Go ahead, yes. Louis. Yes, uh, whistleblowing is when a person within an organization sees wrongdoing, it can be waste, fraud, or abuse, and decides to raise a concern about that. And it's whether they go to the boss, and that's whistleblowing, or go outside the organization. Okay, and so the kind of thing that might occur when they go to the boss, they might either the boss might say, oh, thanks, let's fix that. Or the boss might say, sit down and shut up. This is beyond the scope of your responsibility or That's whatever exactly. else. There could be yes. retaliation, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, okay. And we'll flesh out some of this a bit later. Could you also briefly clarify, Louis, what whistleblowing is not? We want people to understand what it is, but also uh, if you could mention just like one or a couple of the myths about whistleblowing. Well. Yeah, whistleblowing is not an organization, for example, um, I, would, I would point out WikiLeaks, for example, uh, is a media organization and they, they are a transparency organization and they reveal wrongdoing. 
uh -huh. uh, and other and forms of corruption. But that's not whistleblowing. That's an organization, you know, doing its thing. Uh, but whistleblowing is really pretty much a person inside an organization, and not and not a person you know whose job it is to blow the whistle. So we don't. So it's often said like when a media person, a, a reporter, or whatever, uh, reveals something, sometimes they're called a whistleblower, and we would just disagree with that. Yeah, and a whistleblower also is not just some disgruntled employee with a personal axe to grind. It's it's somebody who really is trying to solve a problem, fix something that has gone askew, right? I, absolutely. I mean, it's a disgruntled employee is exactly that. It's a disgruntled employee. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, it, and it's true. Sometimes people might, you know, call themselves whistleblowers and they're, they might not be, uh, they might be disgruntled. But uh, I can guarantee you uh, the management of organizations where there are whistleblowers often call whoever the whistleblower is as disgruntled. Uh -huh. And obviously we would, you know, definitely disagree with that, that concept. Yeah. Yeah. So that's their, that's their defensiveness because they don't want to be held accountable for their mismanagement of the, whatever the operation is. Yeah, could, that's exactly right. Could either of you, go ahead. Yeah. If I could just add as, as a client and, and as someone who had to, a steep learning curve, uh, another way I would put the distinction is I do think the term whistleblower is has a sort of a common usage that is more broad. When where Louis and his organization and my colleague and I intersect, it is no longer about a uh, semantic debate. There are laws, both federal and state, that dictate the definition of who is and who is not a whistleblower. So this isn't just Louis's opinion just as a person. <laughs> Or as right. an educated person, that 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 we start to engage in a process that has legal implications. Yeah, 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 uh, and that the laws are fairly recent. We'll talk about that a bit later in the interview about how to protect whistleblowers. I wonder if each of you, either or both of you, could just briefly mention a couple of examples of whistleblowing, uh, either from a number of years ago or recently. Uh, Louis, for example, some of your clients. Some of your organization's clients that you've helped. Well, I, I would say that probably one of the better known whistleblowers who we represented is Edward Snowden, uh, who blew the whistle on the uh, on the NSA, the National Security a Agency, and uh, he is still in Russia uh, as as a result of not you know, uh, of being you know of attempts to prosecute him. Yeah, not safe for him to come home yet. That's right, but he blew the whistle on the fact of a broad uh, surveillance operation that really involved hundreds of millions of people in this country. I mean, it really did focus on, and it was engaged in uh, providing information or gathering information about all uh, uh, huge numbers of Americans. Yeah, I wonder uh, if, if we could find out some more about the, the work that your organization does, Louis, I very much appreciate the Government Accountability Project. Uh, the website is whistleblower.org, uh, and I've donated financial support, uh, which I enjoy doing. Um, I, I wanna just read what your mission statement says, um, and then ask uh, Louis to comment on this, and then a bit later, uh, Scott can talk about how the organization helped him. Your mission statement says, Government Accountability Project's mission is to promote corporate and government accountability by protecting whistleblowers, advancing occupational free speech, and empowering citizen activists. Founded in 1977, Government Accountability Project is the nation's leading whistleblower protection and advocacy organization. Located in Washington, D.C., government accountability, government accountability Project is a nonpartisan public interest group in addition to focusing on whistleblower support in our stated program areas, we lead campaigns to enact whistleblower protection laws, both domestically and internationally. So that sounds pretty good. Uh, uh, Louis, could you take a few minutes just to summarize uh, the kinds of work that you actually do to implement this mission statement? Yeah, uh, first of all, we are the lawyers for whistleblowers. And in that sense, we're just like any other law firm might be representing people. 
uh, our expertise are, of course, all the whistleblower laws. And, and so we apply that, you know, our knowledge to, the, you know, every case and we, you know, we go to court all the time. Um, we'd certainly go through administrative processes. A second thing that we do that is unlike law firms uh, is we investigate what they have to say. We substantiate it if we're able to. And if we are able to, then what we do is we develop a, a plan, a reform effort in order to essentially solve the problem, try to solve the problem that the whistleblower has identified. And then a third thing, which you've already mentioned, is we work on legislation. We worked on 35 different federal laws uh, that have now been passed. Uh -huh. uh, and there are several more in the hopper. Uh, and then in addition to that, we do a public education kind of, of effort in order to try to change the attitude or the culture yeah. in the country to appreciate whistleblowing. So back when we started 43 years ago, the idea of a whistleblower was sort of like a fink and a tattletale. It was very negative connotation. And what we tried to do and have tried to do for 40 years, and this TV show is, is part of that, is to bring public attention and you know, to the issue, to the, who these people are, and try to change the attitude of the public at large. And the latest poll on this subject, it's almost the only poll, is, um, was um, a year ago, the Maris poll uh, came out and, and established that 86% of voters want whistleblower protection. So it's, it's not, obviously Republicans, Democrats, uh, yeah. it's that huge uh, of change. So it's, it's a sea change from what it used to be. Yeah, that's great. You have a, 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 a circle diagram, Louis, that you could hold up and show if we can position it so the TV viewers will be able to see it. And then you can kind of walk us through what that circle diagram shows. Oh, sure. Uh, this is really what, why a few minutes ago, right before this broadcast, uh, I did draw very, you know, I'm a horrible uh, artist, but anyway, I drew sort of a concept of how we operate. So you get a sense of the kind of strategy. And I think that Dr. Allen uh, can definitely describe how this worked in his case. Yeah. But uh, here's a sort of before, I hope you can see it. Yeah, that's good. Hold it right there. That's good. Okay. The before situation where you have the whistleblower, that little dot there, oh. a whistleblower, and then you have these like red arrows, which is essentially people who work with the whistleblower. This could be a manager. It could be the top manager for that matter. It could be uh, people on the same level as the whistleblower. It could be a subordinate. But all these people are not happy about the whistleblowing for the most part. So they put pressure on the whistleblower to essentially shut up. And then they also create a situation where the whistleblower is isolated and is a pariah within the organization. Uh -huh. So that's before we get involved. After we get, after we get involved, and this, of course, we have to substantiate that they're right. Uh, but after we're involved, then what happens is that we then get like Congress, and then we get the media, and then we get law enforcement, and then we get maybe government regulators. And then I think very importantly, certainly in Scott, Scott's case, uh, is we get other NGO or uh, other non-government organizations. Professional groups. And professional groups, like yeah. uh, engineers. Uh, yeah. Doctors associations. We have yeah. like every major doctor organization in the country supports uh, Dr. Allen, okay. and, for example. And so then what essentially happens is now the organization, that's the O, the organization itself is then on trial. That's what that's our methodology. Very okay. simple. I like that. Scott, Scott, can you tell us how this worked in your case? Uh, Absolutely. Summarizing. Yeah. Be my pleasure. Um, thank you for acknowledging my colleague, Dr. Pamela McPherson. She is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and now a dear friend of mine. Um, the two of us were approached by the Department of Homeland Security in 2014 uh, because of our expertise and our reputations in our field. And we were asked to participate with the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties to inspect family detention centers. Now for context, um, up until 2014, this is under the Obama administration, 
Um, detention of families with children was most uncommon. It, it, it occurred only in the rarest of circumstances. But in 2014, the Obama administration, uh, in response to a large influx of people arriving on our southern border, made a decision to start detaining uh, mothers with their small children um, and, and entered a whole new area of business, as it were, in detention. Um, and, and rapidly ran into problems and experienced multiple complaints and pushback, uh, we were asked to go down and in inspect conditions. Um, we knew before we even departed on that trip, Dr. McPherson and I, that, that there's a rich literature um, that detention of children is, is seriously harmful to their health, primarily mental health, but also physical health with long-term lifelong consequences. So we knew going into this that the idea of detaining children was deeply problematic. But we also knew from both of our extensive experience in, in looking at bureaucracies and challenges, logistical challenges they have, that they were likely to have other difficulties in simply providing adequate care. So the first facility we inspected in 2014 was located in Artesia, New Mexico. It was a rather ad hoc, quickly thrown together facility on the edge of a law enforcement training facility. Um, and we did indeed find rather significant problems, uh, including immediate threats to the health and safety of the families and the children therein. Okay, now, um, uh, can you tell us just a bit more of what you found and then um, what you did to report the problems internally within the Department of Homeland Security? So in this early phase from 2014 to 2018 is the period where we acted entirely internally as the process normally would flow. We, during that period, conducted uh, 10 or 11 uh, detailed inspections, uh, repeat inspections of these facilities. This first one, Artesia, uh, we found uh, something that the staff, the medical staff on site had not yet noticed. We were, uh, our attention was drawn to the complaint that children were losing weight. It's the opposite of what you'd expect in this situation. They've crossed, you know, from Guatemala, from across Mexico on foot, living on the edges. You'd expect children to be malnourished uh, and then put on weight once in a, a humane center. Uh, but what we found is that a significant uh, portion of the children were actually losing weight while under care. It turned out to be because the um, food being provided to them was strange to them and unpalatable. But we also uh, identified while we were there a 16-month-old child who was suffering from diarrheal illness. And because all of the doctors who uh, were working with immigration health had historically not taken care of children, lacked experience, in some cases lacked training, um, they had missed the fact that this child had lost under their watchful eyes, having been examined multiple times over a week-long period, lost almost a third of its body weight. This is almost incompatible with life. Usually we send a child who's got a diarrheal illness to the emergency room once they've lost about 10% of their weight, 30, 31% of their weight, almost incompatible with life. It's a, it's a miracle that this child didn't die. When we drew the, everyone's attention to this, of course, everyone was horrified. Uh, we recommended that uh, they almost lost, you know, because they almost lost the life of the child from a type of medical condition that a third year medical student could diagnose and treat, that they really were getting in over their heads and they needed to shut down this facility. And to their credit, based on our recommendations made right there in the field, they shut down that facility. Unfortunately, they went on to open two new facilities in South Texas, Carnes and Dilly. And those facilities we were asked to inspect and hence the, the, the 10 or, or so inspections and continued to make recommendations that they A, not do this, but if they do do this, they needed to make a number of improvements. Fast forward to the summer of 2018. This is where the story gets very public even before we get involved because that's when the Trump administration decides to start separating the children from their mothers. We all watched this unfold. I think most Americans were horrified by what they saw. And I called Pam, uh, she lives on the other part, side of the country. I called her and I said, I didn't sleep last night after seeing those news stories. And she said, I didn't either. And, and we wondered what, if anything, we could do. And our initial 
feeling is maybe there wasn't much we can do. We were only involved when they ask us to go do an inspection. Technically, these children, once torn from their mothers, were being passed to another government agency outside of Homeland Security. But we very quickly realized that when we saw the pushback from the public and people in government to what they were doing, we started to realize that very likely their fallback position was going to be to rapidly expand a program we knew was harmful and dangerous. So now this is where everything changes for us. We're physicians. Ethically, we know something the government is likely to embark on rapidly uh, poses a serious threat to the health of these children. And we realize ethically as physicians, we have a duty to act. We know it's been four years of going up the chain with these detailed reports saying this is bad and this is harmful. And we know the pace that this is going calls for much more urgent and pressing action. I did know enough that I shouldn't do anything without reaching out and getting professional advice. And that's when I reached out to the Government, Ability, Government Accountability Project and was, was um, very happy that my first connection, when I placed my call, I got lucky enough that uh, Louis himself picked up the phone. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. Um, well, this is where you, we need resources like this to be available and to have, have the head guy there answer the phone, <laughs> happened to be the guy that answered the phone when you called, that was good. But they've got quite a staff, so uh, that, that's good. Um, I, I, will say, I, I will say this is that any one of our staff people would have done the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, did. It, yeah. It, I agree. Yeah, throughout the organization, it's, yeah. uh, this was a, a, a startling uh, revelation. Yeah, yeah. You're the from what I've been able to learn from about the organization, everybody on staff is very mission driven. Everybody is really solidly committed to these kinds of ethical problem solving activities and serving clients like Scott and uh, Pamela, uh, uh, the two doctors in this case. Um, what happened at the outset, uh, Scott, and then maybe. Louis could add something to what Scott says of what the first steps were when you contacted them. Sure. So I, I think uh, Dr. McPherson and, and, and myself, I think we knew by the time we called, we already knew that we were going to do something. What we needed uh, in terms of professional advice is, is we wanted to know how to do it uh, legally, um, but we also wanted to know how to do it effectively. Um, so yes, we wanted to do it in a way that was most proper and, and we would suffer the, the least uh, adverse consequences. But the whole point of doing it was to you know, make a change. In fact, they ask you that. They, 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 when you first do your first intake, they say to you, well, we can guide you through this so you can say your piece and you're protected and we can let it go at that. But as they asked me, do you, do you wanna make a, a statement or do you wanna make a change? Oh. And if you want to make a change, this is where these other aspects that Louis spoke to earlier, it's not just simply making a disclosure, it's really about developing a more sophisticated plan to help craft a solution. You're not just making a complaint, you're trying to propose a solution to the problem you're raising. Ultimately, I want these children to be protected, uh, to not be harmed by my government on our watch. Uh -huh. And so, so this began not just uh, a a encounter with a law office to get advice for a particular disclosure. It, it became a relationship that continues on literally to this day. Here we are in, that, that was 2018. Here we are in, in, in January of 2022. And I literally have been on the phone several times today with Louis' colleagues regarding the more contemporary issues related to COVID-19 oh. as it relates to oh. this ongoing relationship I have. Um, with the government and immigration detention. So, so they, they engaged with me and they engaged with their clients as long as necessary to follow through on what they start. Okay, thanks. Louis, can you add anything to what Scott has said about the interactions and the services that you provided from your angle? Yeah, I, 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 I think he really captured exactly what our, what our process is and what our strategy is. And I can think of very few people 
uh, who have been as effective as uh, both Pam and Scott have been at talking to Congress, you know, talking to the law enforcement, uh, talking to the inspector general offices, uh, speaking to obviously all the professional uh, medical organizations, uh, and, you know, professional organizations, uh, and, and certainly in ha has had a tremendous difference. You know, has they have made a tremendous difference. And many other whistleblowers as a result of their whistleblowing, which is there's a, definitely a pattern, after their whistleblowing, uh, whistleblowers have emerged all over the country in part in response to their coming forward originally uh, back in 2018. Yeah, well, I appreciate your uh, sense of, uh, do you wanna make a statement or you, do you wanna make a change? I mean, that's an important thing. And, uh, and, and you folks help people actually make the change beyond just making a statement. So that's, it's a good strategic uh, pivot to, you know, you, you, you provide some leverage yes. that, that uh, contributes to changing things, solving problems. Um, is there anything else, Scott, that you can say about the help you receive from governmental, uh, government accountability project or any subsequent developments from that, you've covered some of this already. Is there anything else you want to add at this point? Well, just sort of to illustrate the the relationship. Um, so, and I'd like to maybe also really re emphasize the point here. If anyone watches this program at any point in the future and is in a position where they feel they may uh, be covered by uh, whistleblower protection law, as opposed to you know just having something to say. Um, and again, those are uh, waste, fraud, abuse, and in our case, threats to public health and safety. Um, I strongly advise that before you do anything, you really reach out to an organization like Government Accountability Project and get advice before you do anything. Because I think that was one of the two things that made uh, Dr. McPherson and, and my case really atypical in terms of what happened after we made the disclosure. The, the first thing being that we got legal counsel early, early so that, that the organization made sure we went through every step, crossed every T, dotted every I. So, so we, before we did anything, they made sure, well, you've written your 10 reports, good. Who do they go to, All right? Well, maybe next thing to do is write to the top person in your bureaucracy section. So we do that. Have you filed a complaint with the Office of Inspector General? We do that. But we went on up the chain and waited for a response obviously things were pressing, this was a pretty compressed cycle, but we went through and checked all those boxes uh, to make sure that we had really done everything we could before we then went, took the step of making a protected disclosure vetted by lawyers that went to the Whistleblower Protection Caucus in Congress. Wow, now, uh, go ahead, Louie. Well, I was just gonna say, and, uh, uh, I, I will comment on, on, on Scott and Pam's case, but I will, but it, brings up a generality, which is that basically one of the, just a typical example of a mistake that whistleblowers could make is they're really concerned about policy. I mean, most of the people, the implications of whatever wrongdoing they see uh, is going to have, you know, is, you know, reflected in the policy. In other words, they could, they could really dislike the policy. And so therefore they want to speak about the policy. What we talked to them about is let's talk about the specific problems, let other people talk about the policy. Uh -huh. Or if you talk about the policy, do it as a individual and not as part of your whistleblowing so much. So that, that's a, a very typical example where you really want the facts. You really want the specifics, you really want the facts, and then you let the whole universe of people who care about that uh, talk about the policy because it's implications for the policy. Um, so that because you're not protected if you only talk about the policy. Uh -huh. you know, in other words, then you're in an area of vulnerability. Yeah, that's a that's smart insights. Um, and and you know within any kind of governmental system, uh, you know, like before you go to court and sue somebody in superior court in your county. You have to exhaust your administrative remedies, is what they call it. Yeah. And, and so there's that internal process that you're doing before you get to the stage of saying, 
uh, the policy is wrong. I like your emphasis, both of you, on on the facts and and reporting it in the in the chain of command. And at some point, then it goes public to the general public through the media or through Congress or a state legislature or whatever the appropriate bodies are. So that's a smart approach. I wonder if each of you could say something uh, about pu publicity. Uh, Scott, let's start with you. The publicity in your own particular case, you and uh, Dr. McPherson, uh, can you tell us something about the publicity aspects of that? Well, sure. And before I get there, there's one more ring, you know, if you're thinking of starting from an internal process and then going to the next level, there was one more ring that, that we really co-developed. Um, I, you know, uh, Dr. McPherson and I had thoughts on it and had made some initial uh, contacts with our own professional organizations, but then we coordinated that with the Government Accountability Project because we wanted, uh, as he said, we would disclose facts related to threats to public health and safety in particular, but also potentially waste, fraud, and abuse of these uh, contracted programs, um, but that we did need people on the outside who were more free to speak in a general way from a position of authority and expertise to be able to back us up. So that there was, and that was another thing, not every whistleblower has that resource to draw on, but as professionals, if you have professional organizations and your disclosures are consistent with the ethics of your organization, gosh, tap into that too. And we did that with the help very effectively. As, as Louis said, within, uh, I think it was within seven, eight days of our disclosures uh, to Congress, um, 14 national medical organizations, the American Medical Association, American Nursing Association, the American Psychological Association, my organization, American College of Physicians, et cetera, the pediatrics groups and so forth, they all signed a letter. Now, you know, bringing doctors together is like herding cats. So uh -huh. that the 14 uh, national organizations endorsing our concerns that quickly was extraordinary um, in terms of getting attention and establishing the legitimacy was also, I'm sure, very helpful in protecting us. But there, another strategy that the Government Accountability Project is well versed in is effective use and proper use and legal use of disclosures to the press. Now here I'll point out that to this day, uh, Dr. McPherson and I do not like to do press. You should be honored we're on with you. Uh, we're <laughs> delighted to be on with you. But but we never undertook this. We're people who our whole careers have been quietly buried in the belly of these bureaucracies trying to help things run smoothly and efficiently. And we culturally are loath to seeing our faces up on screen um, making disclosures about unpleasant things. And yet it is a tool and it's an effective tool at bringing attention to a problem that needs attention and needs public pressure. So Government Accountability Project was very respectful of our preferences. And early on, you know, we were approached once the disclosures went public, that once we wrote to Congress within hours, it was being reported on in the press, some you know, congressional office handed it off to the press. We were on the front page of the New York Times by the close of the business day. Uh, and we were approached by all the usual media outlets who wanted uh, on-camera interviews. And, and, and Pam and I said, no, we didn't want to do that. But we wanted, well, look, we made a report to Congress. Let's give this a little time to work its way through the system. But by and by, as things happen, after initial flurry of attention, uh, it, it died down, kind of drifted out of the news when in the fall, this is in the summer of 2018 that we initially made the disclosure, in the fall of 2018, uh, Government Accountability Project is approached by 60 Minutes, and 60 Minutes wants to do a story on this topic, and they want us to participate. And you know, again, Pam and I, our initial reaction is, no, we rep can we pass on this? To which our good lawyers say, well, you can, but we would recommend you think twice if you want to get attention to this. This may be one of your best venues. And indeed, it turned out to be a, a another turning point in our story. We. We did the segment, which of course it's 60 minutes. It was well done, happened to be one of the most viewed segments of the year. And one of the first responses publicly was a tweet from the East Coast, three hours before I would even see the program. Uh, then President Trump tweeted out angrily that this program was fake news. Uh, <laughs> ironically serving the function of, of uh, elevating attention to the program. Yeah. But uh, that, that actually turned out to be um, very helpful strategically. It renewed interest. And really, after that point, interest and concern about the safety and welfare of children 
in immigration detention never really left mm -hmm. um, the public sphere again. And I, you know, I think was an issue, one of the major issues in, in the uh, following election um, and continues to get some attention. And we've continued to have engagement after that point uh, at, all, at all sorts of levels. And I think been able to affect a lot of the change we were trying to. Yeah, great, thank you. Louis, can you add anything to what Scott has said? Well, I won't talk about us pulling our hair out <laughs> when 60 Minutes was so excited about the show, a possible show. Um, but, you know, but we don't push uh, whistleblowers to take on more than they feel comfortable doing in terms of the media. And, I, and, I, and I'm really glad that um, Scott talked about this because the, the fact of the matter is almost all whistleblowers do not want to be in the media. I mean, this is a very, very common it's very rare that any of them want any kind of publicity. They would rather not. They're not that kind of people, although the allegations against them, oh, they just want publicity, is very common. It's just not true. But in, in Scott and Pam's case, uh, we basically, one of the things that we, we really do have to tell people is you can't, once you start blowing the whistle, you can't pull back. You have to just keep going. And if it means larger audiences for sure, then it, it is something that you should pursue. But again, that has to be something that the whistleblower uh, you know, feels comfortable doing. And, and we, we wait for them to make that decision. Yeah. Um, what, what I'm hearing from both of you is within your relationship, there's a lot of respect going both ways. The, the, the whistleblowers, Scott and Pamela, uh, are, are respecting their appropriate role in the organization for which they have been providing services. They want to fix things, uh, not just destroy things, but actually fix the problems. And the relationship with the Government Accountability Project uh, is respectful of the whistleblowers and you folks uh, who blow the whistle are respectful of, of the GAP organization. Um, and, and there's a, just a lot of positive, I'm just kind of immersed in this positive relationship of mutual respect and, and, and moving ahead uh, that, that uh, is pretty scarce in a lot of settings. And I'm happy to see it happening here. Um, I know Scott, you had mentioned a few minutes back about uh, professional organizations, doctors' organizations that stepped in in support of, of you and Pamela. And uh, in a lot of people's professions, they have professional ethics as part of being a school teacher, as part of being a nurse, as part of being a lawyer, as part of being whatever. And in some situations, uh, the these ethics are encoded in law so that like uh, uh, in the state where I live, if you're a school teacher and you suspect child abuse, you are required by law to report that suspicions of uh, possible child abuse to the appropriate authorities. And there's all kinds of uh, professions where people have professional responsibilities, even under law, to report uh, or blow the whistle, as you might see. Um, and professional organizations as they did in, in Scott's case, helped a lot. Uh, so I, I appreciate uh, that. Is there anything else, Scott, that you want to add to, uh, to that? And then we move on to the next. No, absolutely. I'm so glad you flagged that because it, it, it brings up a question. I've asked Louis, not for him to answer, because if, the, if he had his druthers, I, I think he agrees with me on this point. You know, when I think of the example of child abuse, which as a physician, you know, we're covered by two. If I examine a child or a disabled yeah. adult, or a vulnerable elderly person, I suspect abuse. If it were the whistleblower model, it would say something like, well, if you do report that to the appropriate authorities, you know, you have some protections if they try to retaliate. That would be sort of the whistleblower law approach to it. But no, it's much more affirmative. It says, no, who would possibly want to defend, you know, not yeah. reporting? Uh, that's untenable. Yeah. yeah. And it makes me wonder when I think about the state, the evolution in the state of whistleblower law. Why is it that where what the law says now is if you do report waste, fraud, abuse, threats to public health and safety, you may have certain protections uh -huh. from being retaliated against. 
why in some areas aren't federal employees, for example, or federal contractors required to have an affirmative responsibility to report waste, fraud, and abuse. You'd, you'd think that would be a model we would try to work towards. And, and it will also maybe uh, change the frame, that pejorative frame that whistleblowers get. Look, yeah. I agree with Louie. Most whistleblowers are people who weren't looking for attention, in fact, are loath to walk down that path, but really believe that government and government functions, or whether it's corporate in that sphere, um, be, be organizations of integrity, do their work properly, do it without corruption. And when there are serious problems that those should be tackled and addressed. Those are sort of publicly minded, service minded, ethically driven decisions. Well, these, these are very much embedded in the public consciousness and the public ethics. This is not a partisan matter, as, as Louis said earlier. This is something that, that pretty much everybody agrees. We want these kinds of honesty, fairness, efficiency kinds of things, it's pretty much universal. And it's not something that one party will support the other party oppose. Uh, and, and so we, we can draw upon that. And that's why those laws exist. And it'd be nice to see them expand further. I know that Louis's organization is always pushing ahead with this. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to say too, is that in a huge percent of the people who are now sort of publicly identified as whistleblowers really were nothing more than good ethical uh, high standards high professional standards employees who were just doing their job and then they were retaliated against for doing their job they never intended to go public right. they never intended to be whistleblowers they don't even most of them don't even like the term whistleblowing whistleblowers they just we're doing their job. And that's a huge, huge percent of the people who, who are whistleblowers. And it's, they become whistleblowers in a sense, defending themselves. So in defending themselves, then they, they also realize, well, I guess I'm a whistleblower. You know, they, <laughs> they hadn't really thought about it and they were just doing their job. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction for the public to understand. I'm glad that you reinforced that. What else can you tell us, Louis, about uh, federal or state legal protections. I don't know if all states have laws. I mean, there, there are some laws at the federal level. I don't know if all states have laws, um, but what can you tell us about federal or state laws? Yeah, there, I would, first of all, on the state level, and we, we don't, haven't worked with too many states, but we have a few. Um, but the states are all over the place in terms of the, their whistleblower laws, some are not particularly effective, others are much better. The, I would say definitely majority of states, probably around 42 or 43, um, uh, 43 of the states have whistleblower laws. They're not always that effective. Uh, and in terms of the uh, federal government, anyone who's a government employee, anyone who's a contractor to the government, and very importantly, in terms of corporate, the corporate world, anyone who works for a publicly traded company, if they're blowing a whistle on things that have to do with the bottom line of the company or in terms of the stock price or the stock uh, integrity of the company, uh, and it's not reported, um, you know, properly, uh, they can uh, have whistleblower protection, anything dealing with the environment, uh, public health, and uh, so there's vast, uh, vast number of issues where the government, the federal government, has a role, and there are whistleblower protections for for those people as well, the corporate people, banking, for a good example. Yeah. Now, um, Louis, I wonder could, if you could just like briefly suggest any ways of strengthening what, in what ways would should federal laws or state laws be strengthened? Are, are there some broad themes that yes. you can mention just briefly? Well, yes, yeah, so briefly in terms of federal employees, they need to have the ability to go into federal district court. For 40 years, we have advocated that they be able to go into court because what's happening is those cases stay within the bureaucracy and the bureaucracy is amazingly hostile yeah. toward whistleblowing. And, 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 the, and the processes 
of uh, exerting your rights within that bureaucracy are very difficult. We win most of our cases, oh. but that's because, you know, that's because we bring national attention to them and we have a reputation. But there's so many people who don't have the benefit of our help and they get absolutely squashed in the federal bureaucracy system. Yeah. In terms of state, I mean, in terms of corporate, we want all the laws to be the same. So you have the same process. So you have, in other words, the meat, you know, meat, uh, uh, the meat regulate regulation or the food regulation or drug regulation, all those companies where, uh, where the government has a regulatory responsibility, all those corporate people should have the same kind of rights and they're not. It depends on the subject matter. Uh, for example, it, a, a good example, and I won't, you know, try to be succinct, but if you have a pizza that has meat on it, then if you're blowing the whistle on the production of that, you have protection. But if there's not meat on it, you don't have protection. <laughs> that sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd, but that's the kind of thing that we want, run into in terms of the, the public, the private sector. Yeah, and 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 we've known for decades and decades uh, that that so-called regulatory agencies very often are captured by the industries that they're supposed to regulate. So presidents and governors appoint industry insiders to regulate, supposedly regulate the industries that these appointees actually come from, and so it's a sweetheart deal rather than honest regulation. So we need to fix that, and that's something that the voters need to hold the politicians accountable for. I want to follow up, uh, just is there anything else, Louis, that you want to say about the strategies and activities of the governmental uh, Government Accountability Project? Um, you have had that circle thing that summarized it, and you've talked about a few other things. Are there any other intentions or strategies or activities that you want to help us understand yeah, I, I mean, now. yeah, I think that ultimately, yeah, uh, the concept that people need to know, and and I'd like to talk about truth telling because every but every whistleblower I know would much rather have a description of being a truth teller rather than to be a whistleblower because it it sort of get gets at the essence of what they're trying to do, which is just tell the truth, and so truth tellers in terms of the. Uh, you know, the, in, in terms of what they do uh, should be essentially honored. They should get prizes for what they do. They should be recognized for what they do. Uh, and, and I think that's an important consideration uh, for, you know, for the public to understand. And also, if there are people in the local communities uh, and or in the, in the local church or synagogue uh, where someone's a whistleblower, that organization would be helpful for that local organization, whatever it might be, to stand behind the whistleblower because it's, it's a lonely battle. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to befriend these people, to help them through the process. Because one of the things that happens to whistleblowers is all of a sudden they lose a lot of friends. Right. Uh, and, 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 and so they need to surround themselves with some additional or new you know, types of friends who will essentially be a positive force in their life. Thanks. I, I also heard that sometimes uh, a whistleblower's uh, marriage might break apart or other kinds of traumas might happen. And uh, uh, Scott, you told me when we were preparing for the interview that that did not happen in your case. <laughs> uh, but can you tell us what has happened to you since this 2018 yeah. um, exposure? Well, uh, I'm glad you mentioned marriage. It allows me to uh, publicly and once and again thank my wife for standing solidly behind me. I will um, share with you, I've shared this with Louis, he knows this. Her father was a um, civil rights hero in Mississippi. Um, oh. He worked with Medgar Evers and helped uh, integrate the Masonite plant in Laurel, Mississippi, a, a wonderful, wonderful man. Oh. Um, and so she comes from a tradition of believing and doing the right thing and understanding that risk is involved. Uh, Dr. McPherson would say the same thing of her husband, that he stood right solidly behind her. So that, that's appreciated. But to the extent that we were able to get through this relatively unscathed, I mean, I think the, the punchline that I think a lot of people are surprised to hear at this point is I, as of today, still uh, work with the Department of Homeland Security. 
Um, but I, I, I know that the reason that I still work with the Department of Homeland Security is I was backed up by the medical profession, but, but mostly because I got good advice on how to negotiate this very difficult journey and path that wasn't just legal advice on, on how to avoid major pitfalls. It drew on decades of expertise that people like Louis have on how to engage with the government and convince them at some level that we are being sincere in our effort to try to do the right thing and to try to do it in the right way. And I think that kind of really comprehensive kind of support that an organization like Government Accountability Project uh, provided not only made us more effective, but on a personal level, uh, gave me the type of support on what otherwise could have been a very lonely journey as you described. Yeah, I appreciate uh, 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 Louis's work since 1977, 78, and the Government Accountability Project that spun off from the Institute for Policy Studies, another organization I've been donating to actually since the 1970s. Um, and I featured people from the Institute for Policy Studies on my TV program. Um, and I appreciate that. And uh, the, the uh, to prepare for this program, I've studied up some about governmental, uh, the Government Accountability Project. And the website is whistleblower.org. And I've enjoyed uh, learning about their activities. I've enjoyed donating uh, substantial money over the past decade or so. And I appreciate uh, the things that they identify on their website that they do, things that Louis has told us about. They represent people like other law firms do. They investigate, organize, and take other activities for the whistleblower's concerns so that the whistleblowers don't drown in the waves that they've created and so that we can actually end up moving forward with some reforms in those organizations, whether it's in the public sector or private sector. They promote legislation and they educate the public. And so I really appreciate all of that. Uh, Louis, beyond what we've said about the organization, uh, is there anything you'd like to reinforce about the work of the Government Accountability Project? Yeah, I, I think that we recognize 43 years ago and have proven since that time uh, the value of that is we have to think in terms of the truth or in terms of information, either one, but information truth is in and of itself power. And so it's, and it gravitates toward those people who essentially have that information, that power to make a difference. And on the other hand, the people who are corrupt are the people who try to suppress that information and keep it within the organization or keep it to a small group of people. And, that, and so that, that dynamic is, is essentially something that we're seeing play, play out on the national scene all the time and yeah. these days in particular. Right, now, I strongly support democracy and democracy needs truth telling, information sharing, all that stuff so the public can make their own best decisions and not be fooled by somebody who's trying to uh, baloney us into yeah. uh, uh, seeing things only from their angle, but let's, let's get the public well informed. And I appreciate how well uh, the Government Accountability Project does that and other people that I have as guests on my program for informing the public about things that the public needs to know about so we can have a better democracy and solve the problems. And we've had really over the years, a lot of uh, powerful whistleblowers. Um, I appreciate Daniel Ellsberg, who famously reported uh, in the Pentagon Papers 50 years ago, how the US government had persistently lied to us about the Vietnam War. We've had a lot of people in the national security establishment who've blown the whistle. Uh, you've already mentioned uh, Edward Snowden. Um, and there have been people within the CIA and National Security Agency and other entities. I read the book written by John Kiriakou, who uh, blew the whistle on the CIA from based on his experience when he worked there. But we've also had Chelsea Manning and Daniel Hale, who blew the whistle on drone warfare, and Rowdy Winter, and a bunch of others. And so this, this is, the, the, some of what they did was leaks, but a lot of it was really whistleblowing as you've defined it. And we need to engage the public in understanding these things. Um, I very much do appreciate your organization. Um, I, 
encourage people watching this interview to look for more sources of information out there. When I post this video to my blog, I'll type up a very thorough summary of what we said during the interview and post that thorough summary to my blog along with the video that people are seeing now on TV. And um, we'll have links at the end of that for more information. There's some other good organizations too working on this. I, I also support and appreciate a different nonprofit organization, the Project on Governmental Oversight, POGO. They're nonpartisan, they're independent nonprofit organization, and they investigate and expose waste, corruption, abuse of power, and so forth within the public uh, or within the, the government so the public can see what's happening. And their website is pogo.org. Um, and I appreciate alternative and progressive news media that put this stuff out even when the mainstream press typically does not cover it well enough. So I invite people to look for alternative and progressive news media. Um, and um, uh, let's see. People can watch the uh, this interview and read the thorough summary at my blog, parallaxperspectives.org. Parallax has one R and two L's in it, parallaxperspectives.org. Click TV programs and then look for the, the uh, title of this uh, episode, Whistleblowers Serve the Public, Let's Protect Them. I wanna thank uh, Louis Clark. I wanna thank Dr. Scott Allen for the courage that they've been bringing and the good energy and the truth telling power that they've been bringing to their work and for the insights that they've shared during this one hour interview. I encourage every person to pay attention to their best values and find ways to act upon your best values. Even if you're not technically a whistleblower, you can stand up in all kinds of ways for truth, fairness, and compassion in every aspect of your daily life. So let's, let's practice that at the grassroots personal level, uh, even if you don't have a job uh, that, that exposes you to those uh, opportunities and needs. Uh, sometimes you might feel the need to take stronger nonviolent actions to support truth and fairness and compassion. And so I invite people to do what uh, one of the great nuclear weapons activists in our region used to say, take one step out of your comfort zone. <laughs> that was the late Jackie Hudson. She was uh, a pacifist nun who was a guest on my TV program and spent a lot of time uh, protesting nuclear weapons and sometimes in, in jail uh, for that. Um, I have always appreciated people's conscience. In 1972, my draft board recognized that I am indeed a conscientious objector. And I did two years of alternative service. I worked for the state of Washington's agency that deals with welfare programs, the public assistance system. And I could see problems in that system that were uh, not criminal, but they were dysfunctional and really quite cruel to people who were poor. And so I wrote a report identifying some of the systemic problems. I shared that report with my state legislator and other state legislators, one of whom said it was the best single report he had seen on the topic. And uh, my uh, legislator got me a chance to meet, to share my report with the head of the giant state agency that runs that system. And he read it and I had a face-to-face -face meeting with him and, and we were able to discuss various points on it. I also testified to the state legislative committees um, at the request of a racial justice organization uh, based in Seattle. And uh, so the, this wasn't the kind of whistleblowing that you folks do, but again, it's an example of what ordinary people can do in their ordinary lives and just take one step out of your comfort zone and do the right thing. So I encourage every person to pay attention to their best values, find ways to act upon them. And even if you're not a whistleblower, live your daily life ethically, make valid and ethical choices. Uh, you can get information about a wide variety of issues related to peace, social justice, and nonviolence through my blog, parallaxperspectives.org. Again, Parallax has one R and two L's. Uh, you can also phone me at 360-491-9093. We are all one human family. We all share one planet. You can make a better world, but we all have to work at it. And the world needs just exactly what you have to offer. So thanks to Scott. Thanks to Louie. 
and thanks to all of you folks. Thank you. Okay.